We now move on to uh, questions to the Minister of Health, Social Services and Public Safety. And I call Maeve McLaughlin. Uh, question number one, please. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker. With your permission, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I'd like to take questions 1, 5 and 15 together. It has been clear for a number of years that our health and social care services in Northern Ireland are facing significant challenge of rising demand, rising expectations and tightening finances. I cannot hope to respond to those challenges unless we are focused on ensuring the highest quality and safety of care, that we configure our services correctly and have an appropriate administrative structure. Currently, there are simply too many layers of administration in our system, making it difficult to meet those challenges to drive change and weakening accountability. I want to drastically de-layer the system, removing complexity, to bring greater accountability and better responsiveness. I want our trusts to be responsible for the planning of care in their areas and have the operational independence to deliver it. I want to see my department take firmer strategic control of our health and social care system. I have therefore announced we will close the Health and Social Care Board, as I believe we no longer need a standalone organisation. I do intend to retain a public health agency with a renewed focus on early intervention and prevention, working more closely alongside the Department in this essential work. I have also announced a panel to lead a debate on the best configuration of health and social care services in Northern Ireland. It is important that this is a clinically led debate with clinical evidence for any proposed change to services and evidence about the implications of failing to make changes. I envisage a panel comprising around half a dozen experts drawn from across the sphere of health and social care. I hope to be able to announce the membership of the panel shortly and that it will begin its work before Christmas. One of their first tasks will be to convene a summit involving political parties to gather ideas, suggest solutions, and I hope collectively reach agreement on a shared vision for the future of health and social care in Northern Ireland. As I've said before, these changes are about moving towards a more streamlined, more accountable structure so that we can make the most of the talent of our staff, encourage innovation and create a more efficient system. While there may be some savings, my focus is on getting the structures right. All health and social care bodies are subject to challenging efficiency savings and until detailed work has been completed. Does the need extra time? Uh, yes, uh, sorry, Deputy Speaker, I thought that, that was uh, requested beforehand, but appreciate that. Thank you. All health and social care bodies are Subject to challenging efficiency savings and until detailed work has been completed, it is not possible to identify whether any additional savings could be delivered. I hope that all the political parties will embrace the opportunity for change and take the opportunity to work positively to create a world-class health and social care system in Northern Ireland. I call Mia McLaughlin. Well, I thank the Minister for that detail. And whilst I have been very welcoming of the reform uh, agenda that he takes forward. Can I ask specifically in relation to the, the board's figures on waiting times for elective care? Um, they were published the period April to August, showing that all trusts were failing in their targets, and one trust was actually 17 per cent behind target. Can I ask specifically then how this reform proposal will tackle this very direct need? Can I again um, welcome her welcome of the proposals that I put forward nearly a, a fortnight ago? Uh, and I, I, I particularly welcome it because it, I think the Chair um, has taken the proposals that I put forward in the proper spirit, uh, recognising the fact that there is uh, an additional layer of bureaucracy in our system which is getting in the way of frontline de delivery, which is what she um, focused upon, and also was proven in the past a barrier to innovation across our health and social care system, and I think she and I are as one in, in wanting to see that bureaucracy removed from our system. And, and that's how, um, while not specifically helping in the cases that she talks about, uh, the Finance Minister was just in her place outlining the difficulties we have had this year uh, in terms of finances. There are pressures that are increasing and driving up uh, mm -hmm. demand and driving up our, our waiting lists, but we've also had the situation where we have been losing money through welfare reform penalties, and I like her don't wish to dwell on that. I hope that in other parts of this building and this estate we will be able to reach a, a swift conclusion to those issues around our budget and around welfare reform that have been bedeviling us, and that that will then uh, result in a resolution to welfare reform which will result in more money for waiting lists, and that's certainly what I have been lobbying my colleague, the Finance Minister, for. Um, so there, there is not, what, what, what we need in the short and indeed the long term is an injection of resources into tackling waiting lists. That's what I am seeking. That's what I want. Uh, that's what I hope can happen. These changes in and of themselves will not address that, other than 
the fact that they will make the system a £4.7 billion pounds health and social care system uh, in Northern Ireland work more efficiently, and particularly by taking out that layer of bureaucracy which she has focused on and I have focused on, uh, we can make that system, which hasn't been working to its full, which hasn't been working to its optimum over the last number of years since its inception in 2009, work more efficiently and get more resources into the front line. And any savings that are realised, I want to see going back into the front line, helping patients, helping people across Northern Ireland. I call Peter Weir. The Minister, in, um, in order to make the necessary changes, has always referred to the need for a transformation fund. Uh, can the Minister give us advice on whether he envisages extra income generation measures will also be required? The, the, we, need to be, we need to be clear, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, that in wanting to transform um, our health and social care system, yes, we do need more resources. Uh, and it might seem sort of almost counterintuitive to, to want to get a most efficient use out of the resources that we have, understanding the pressures that we face right across our entire budget that we would want to see and we would need to see more money going into health and social care in order to get a more efficient system. But, I've, but particularly in the, in the short term, we need a boost over the next number of years to make those sorts of changes that might come forward as a result of the recommendations from any panel are a reality. We will need an injection of cash. If we want to do some of the innovative things which many of our trusts are doing, we will need to have money to do that that isn't money that's coming away from the front line. And I think that has been the challenge in the past. We've had to, to fund innovation. Money has had to come from the front line. And that's, that's not an, a never an easy thing to do. The reforms don't depend in and of themselves on, on, on more income generation. Uh, I suppose the one that might have been a possibility to get more money into the uh, system in the short term. It might have been a reintroduction of, of prescription charges. And, and I'm aware that there has been a, a campaign running recently which is opposed to the reintroduction of prescription charges, or perhaps more accurately, wanting to exempt certain people from prescription charges. My own personal view is that if we were to introduce, reintroduce prescription charges, it should be for, uh, for everyone, or, or, for no, uh, or else we should stick with, with no one and we shouldn't be having exemptions. I think there has been a misunderstanding, which this, unfortunately this campaign has, not, um, uh, has made, which is that the proposal that was made in a recent consultation was for a small charge, around, say, 50p or a pound, up to a maximum of about £20 or £25 a year. Um, I don't think, given the lack of uh, political consensus that there is, that there will be any introduction a reintroduction of prescription charges, uh, certainly in my time uh, as minister. Um, but there will be consequences of that. This is not a uh, not having prescription charges, not having the income that that would raise, is not something that would be without consequences in terms of paying for some of those very expensive new drugs and treatments that are out there. So there may be some see, see, some may see some degree of set, success in not having uh, prescription charges reintroduced, but there will be consequences sometimes even for those um, people who are very sick and relying on new drugs. I call Adrian McCormick. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the Minister for his responses so far there. Minister, um, by abolishing this board, uh, what impact will it have on frontline services, if any at all? Well, there, there will be a, a, an impact, as I, as I said, in terms of um, an impact on um, creating a more efficient system. Uh, and that's something that, that I want to see. That's where the, the impact of um, a reforms that I have put forward will, will be most, most targeted upon, and that is where uh, my biggest aim and objective is. is to, it has not been something where you know, I have not wanted to dwell on issues around staff, because, as I have said in the, in the statement that I made in Ballymena a couple of weeks ago, that I think we have some tremendous staff within our system who are working exceptionally well, doing some exceptional things, um, but we are not getting the best of their talents because of the system that they operate in, that very bureaucratic system uh, that we have. Some have um, wanted to focus on the issue of staff, saying that it was an easy decision to, to make to get rid of the board because it had become uh, big in terms of its numbers. Um, and, and yes, it has risen in numbers. It started pretty high and under the tenure of uh, Mr. Majimsi whenever he was health minister. He uh, started around 390 full-time equivalents within the board. And yes, it has grown to 600, but it was always quite a big beast, no matter what his intentions were for it. Uh, over the same period, um, since 2010, um, the number of staff within the Department of Health, Social Services and Public Safety has dropped dramatically. In March 2010, the number of full-time equivalents within the department were 670. Um, in November of, of 2015, so the most up-to-date figures that we have, the number of staff within the department is at 466. So there has been a one-third reduction in the number of staff within the department uh, over the last four years, and that number is set to go down further. Uh, the voluntary exit scheme, which my colleague, the finance minister, referenced earlier, 
uh, we'll, see, we'll see 43 full-time equivalent posts removed from the department by the end of 15-16 this uh, current year, and that will have half a million pounds worth of savings in year and 1.5 million pounds recurring savings thereafter. So, um, the issue around the board and its staffing levels, yes, it has grown in size, but similarly, a reduction in the number of staff within the department has occurred over the same period. I call Fergal McKinney. Mr. Deputy Speaker, um, the, the TYC plan had consensus, but not enough money. Uh, he's now seeking a further consensus and pointing to the potential for money, but no guarantee that, in fact, uh, the minister can get it. Uh, isn't that a fatal flaw in his plan? No, I don't believe it is. And I don't think we should be looking for fatal flaws in the plan. I think we should be seeking to build that uh, political consensus. I'm sorry, I, I haven't had a, a chance to um, formally, I th I th in very informally earlier, congratulate him on his um, a victory at the weekend. I'm not say too much given who is sitting directly behind him at this moment in time. Um, uh, I, I, do, I congratulate him and I, I, I congratulate Mr. E congratulate Mr. Eastwood. It sounds like a famous boxer sort of thanking Mr. Eastwood or Mr. Eastwood in the past. Um, I suppose taking over the reins of the SDLP so, sh so close to a, uh, an election is perhaps like uh, taking over a managerial office in a uh, Premier League team who are sitting at the bottom of the table with only about 10 matches to go, but I'm sure the member and, and his party colleagues will hope that he's more, more Tony Pulis than Felix McGath, um, but with time will tell, and I wish him, and I wish him well. Um, I don't think we should be looking for, I think we should be looking for, I think we should be looking for a political consensus, uh, because the prize of that political consensus is crafting and building and putting in place that world-class health and social care system that I think we should, we know what we can have in Northern Ireland that Sir Liam Donaldson pointed towards in his report that I think that we all want to see happen uh, here in Northern Ireland. And yes, it does depend on resources. I don't want to labour the points that I've made to Mr Weir. It absolutely does require resources to make that transformation. That will require some difficult decisions by, uh, by me. It will require some difficult decisions by the executive. But what I would hope would happen is that given the extent of the prize that is there, given the challenges that are facing our health and social care system, that we can all unite as one to lobby for those additional resources to put in place a transformation fund that will make that vision of a, a world-class health and social care system a reality. And, you know, and I look to the member as much as I look to any other members for support in trying to realise that goal. I call Mike on the gym uh, Deputy Speaker, uh, as far as the changes that you're proposing to make are concerned, uh, and these are contained uh, with, from Liam Donaldson, uh, and I note that at the committee and in previous utterances you had estimated around 18 months, I believe, to deliver this, this change. I see Liam Donaldson in the press over the weekend saying that's far too long a time to take. You must shorten that. Have you reconsidered now your time frame? Uh, Sir, Sir Liam Donaldson, I, I, mean, I, I, welcome, I welcome what he said whenever I made my speech, and I, and I actually welcome the, the comments that he made last week as well, Deputy Speaker. Um, he welcomed um, my decision to get rid of the board, and yes, he made the points around, around timescale. Um, I think that um, that's significant that he, he, he said that, yes, we absolutely should be getting rid of that additional layer of bureaucracy that, it was, that is, exists within our health and social care system that was created, uh, as, a, as a member knows very well, back in, in 2009. So I, I welcome uh, what Mr Donaldson Sir, Sir Liam said in respect of that. Um, I think there has been, um, I made the point around the implementation of possible recommendations uh, that might flow from the work of a panel uh, that they may take between five years and ten years to implement in full. Um, what, what I think will happen in terms of or what should happen over the next 18 months, and I've used the 18-month figure, Deputy Speaker, f uh, for practical consideration, this would be 18 months to pass, I believe, and then implement the legislation that would be required to do away with the board. What I want to see take place in between, and, and officials have been tasked to do this job, is that they have been tasked to uh, scope out what steps can be taken before or without the need for legislation to pass and to start to implement those steps as quickly as possible so that we can have the effect of the reforms that I propose, which is about taking out that bureaucracy, focusing on innovation, encouraging innovation, that we can have all of that without actually the need to pass the legislation. And where we need to pass legislation, we will do that, but being realistic about the timescale that we're in so close to uh, an election and dissolution of this assembly, I don't believe that that will be able to be passed through in time uh, for the end of March. And realistically, that will have to be introduced very quickly after the next um, election um, and implemented, I believe, um, early in the, uh, early in the or at the beginning of the next financial year. So the 18 months is a practical point, as opposed to one that 
I would like to see it happen quicker. I wish I could flip back, click my fingers and make it happen overnight, but unfortunately it can't. I call Dominic Bradley. My, uh, question number two, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker, the Autism Act uh, NI 2011 required my department to lead on the development and implementation of a cross departmental <coughs> autism strategy. Every department has signed up to this strategy, and it is an important commitment for the executive. Although my report is not due until January 2017, given mm. the focus on this issue, I have decided to provide members with a detailed report on progress against the Autism Action Plan. I have therefore issued a written statement to members mm. advising that a progress report on the cross-departmental autism strategy 2013 to 2020 and action plan 2013 to 2016 has been placed in the assembly library and has been published. Many aspects of the strategy are progressing well, with better access to services for people with autism and their families and carers, the appointment of a regional ASD coordinator, and training for frontline staff, education professionals, youth workers, and parents and carers. There is also better awareness of support services through signposting by HSE trusts as part of their triaging process. However, it is undoubtedly the case that the unprecedented increase in referrals has created a major challenge for the system. Over the past six years, referrals of children and young people for assessment have nearly doubled from around 1,500 to 2,936 per year. This has inevitably resulted in longer waiting times for the first assessment and ultimate diagnosis. Therefore, while I am pleased with the progress, which has been made to date, there is room, no room for complacency, and I will continue to work with the board and the trusts to tackle the current difficulties and to improve access to services. I call Dominic Bradley. I will to ask you to call you. Um, considering the importance of early diagnosis and early intervention uh, to uh, people who have autism, does the minister not, since he's so fond of footballing metaphors, does he not see that he is in the bottom league regarding autism, uh, given the fact that there are 1,400 people awaiting diagnosis? I don't come to the House, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, uh, and say those sorts of figures or statistics with any sense of pride. Far from it. Um, I think that any situation, and, and the Act has helped, along with the work of many charities working in the field of autism, raise awareness of, of, of autism. Uh, and I think it, um, it is a positive thing that that has happened. Um, it has created a, an increase, a significant increase in demand, a doubling of demand in terms of the number of referrals. As I said in my original answer, an increase from 1,500 to nearly 3,000 this year. Um, and obviously that puts an understandable pressure and strain on the resources that, that I have uh, at my disposal. Um, and I do accept the point around early diagnosis. I accept that point. Uh, and what, has, what we have been attempting to do, and, and just because an, an ultimate diagnosis hasn't happened doesn't mean that there isn't support or interventions. Quite the opposite, there are interventions which take place prior to uh, ultimate uh, diagnosis. Um, you know, so um, many um, you know, work from community paediatrics, speech and learning, or speech and language therapy, occupational therapy, um, social services, education, psychology, as appropriate as an intervention even in advance of, of diagnosis. We are working hard at trying to reduce the impact of the long waits by, by looking and reviewing autism assessment processes. So it's quite a, a long, extensive process. We're looking at what we can do to streamline that as possible, but still having a, a high quality of, of diagnosis. We're looking at standardising autism service models across all trusts, and we're looking at extending services capacity through greater integration and alignment of autism services with other child development and young people's mental health services. So it isn't as if we've sat back and done nothing. It isn't even as if um, before diagnosis, nothing happens in terms of, of interventions. Yes, more could be done, but to deliver more, we need more resources. And the member knows full well the pressure that are on the resources in this department, and he will also appreciate and understand, I hope, that the £9.5 million pounds a month that is being lost through welfare reform penalties um, because of the failure of his party and others to live up to their commitments around welfare reform is costing the member rolls his eyes, but is a serious issue. We cannot afford to lose that amount of money, which could be going to the front line. Can I, can I ask uh, members to check that their mobile devices are off and are not causing interference? Um, I call Gary Middleton. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Can I thank the Minister for his answer so far. Uh, can the Minister outline how the numbers of assessments provided and the numbers of diagnoses of autism made has changed in recent years? As I mentioned uh, to um, Mr Bradley, the, the number of 
referrals. So the number over the past six years, um, so pretty much the, the period uh, the, the bill came into place and came in act in 2011. So from just before that, the number of referrals of children and young people for assessment have nearly doubled. Uh, from around 1,500 to close to 3,000 this year, and resources haven't increased at a commensurate rate. And, and we need to um, invest more. I accept the point that other members have made. We absolutely need to invest more in um, getting staff into the front line. And we estimate that some around 20 to 23 uh, whole time equivalent clinical staff would be required to do that. The cost of doing that, Mr. Deputy Speaker, would be around in a, a million pounds additional um, uh, expenditure. So. Whenever members opposite roll their eyes about raising issues around welfare reform and the loss of £9.5 million every single month, £1 million of that £9.5 million, so £1 million out of £9.5 million, million lost in one month, would cover the increased cost that there is. So whenever people sit and, and take their positions in opposing welfare reform, and I hope that we can resolve these issues over the next number of days, and that will free up, I hope, more resources to go into the front line, to deal with waiting lists, to deal with other problems. There are consequences for taking the ideological position that some have taken in respect of welfare reform and not living up to, to their commitments that they made last year. And we can see it here in autism, we can see it in waiting lists, and we can see it elsewhere. Mr. Deputy Speaker, the Minister will be aware that of the old saying, prevention is better than cure, and those figures that the Minister has given us, which we, we, we know is fact, is absolutely staggering that the number of uh, youngsters coming forward with di uh, being diagnosed with autism is staggering. C can the Minister advise the House if there is a proper investment going in to uh, scientists, to universities, etc., to try and, 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 and see what the cause of that? Because it's, it's staggering and it's going from worse to worse as the year goes on. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I, I, you know, I, I wouldn't have the expertise to delve into why there has been an increase, a doubling over a very, very short, and this is over a six-year period. This is not over some much length. It's a very, very short period where we've had a doubling in the number of referrals. Uh, you know, and I think that um, perhaps the fact that there is an increased awareness um, of the existence of autism has perhaps been one of the contrary. I think it would be fair to say that that has been a contributing factor. Um, in terms of, I think there are, I think it'd be free enough to say that there is obviously support and work going on in, in terms of research. Um, to the extent to which my department is contributing or funding or supporting that, I, I couldn't say, but I'm, I'm happy to write to the member and inform him of, of, of what support. I know that we will be supporting in various ways through trusts, through the PHA, through others, uh, helping various autism charities across Northern Ireland. He and I will know of some that are operating within our own constituency. I'm sure that's replicated around Northern Ireland. Uh, I'm sure that support is going to those from, from the health and social care sector. To the extent to which that is happening, I will inform the member of. I call Cathal Boylan. Uh, last can call you, uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And could ask the Minister, will he ensure that all those partners that are in the plan, autism plan, will ensure can he ensure that they will commit to doing their role on addressing autism? Yeah, I mean, as I said in my original response, uh, all departments have bought into the, the strategy and the action plan. Um, and I have I know that officials from my department have been working very closely with officials from the Department of Education because of obviously the, um, the direct read across in terms of particularly you know, young, young people, children and young people who are at school and the impact on their, their education. So I know that there is work going on at a practical level as well as obviously agreement in terms of the strategy and action plan. And, and um, I think there is, a, following from the Act and its passage back in 2011, good cross departmental work um, going on in respect of autism. Moving on, I call Bronwyn McGahan. Question three. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I have not held any discussions with the current provider of the service. The Public Health Agency commissions Lifeline and is also undertaking a consultation process on the new service model. The agency participated in a Contact NI staff workshop on the 10th of October to outline the proposals and offered to attend a second workshop which was su subsequently cancelled by Contact NI. Contact NI staff have attended a number of the public consultation workshops organised by the Public Health Agency and have expressed their views at these events. The proposed model retains the core elements of the existing service, namely the free-to-call crisis telephone helpline, which will be accessible 24 hours a day, qualified helpline operatives who are skilled in talking to people in crisis and who have professional skills in listening and in assessing suicide risk, the ability to direct callers to the most appropriate service for their needs, and finally follow-on support from locally based suicide prevention organisations enhanced with complementary therapies and local face-to-face -face immediate support. For callers at high risk, the helpline staff would 
directly arrange further care through to emergency mental health services. By splitting the management of immediate helpline support from follow-up support, the proposals avoid a potential perverse incentive whereby the helpline provider could potentially gain financially from referring a client to follow-up support, which they also deliver. This does not infer in any way that Contact and I have sought financial gain in this manner. I, I thank the Minister for his response. Could I ask the Minister to give serious consideration um, to an extension of, of the Lifeline contract to allow for further consultation on the future of Lifeline services? Sir, Deputy Speaker, there, was a, there have been actually three offers of an extension of the existing contract. Um, there was an, uh, an offer, two, two offers were turned down. The contract, as the member might know, uh, expires on the 31st of December, but I'm glad to say that the third offer of a contract extension to the end of September 2016 has been agreed, and that allows, obviously, then for continuity of service while we move to a new model of service delivery. Gordon Lyons. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, then, further on from that answer uh, from the Minister, can he confirm that a lifeline service uh, will continue and that this is about the way in which it is delivered in the organisations uh, that deliver it? Yes, I can. I, I, mean, I think this has again been because of the nature of the campaign and the way the campaign has been styled. It has been a campaign about protecting lifeline. Now, I'm going to be absolutely clear. I've, I've done it previously in this House. I'll do it again now. That the Lifeline service and the Lifeline brand will, will remain. This is, as, as the member says in his question, entirely about getting the best possible service moving forward, getting the service integrated better into um, other emergency uh, right across the, the system, into other emergency services, um, about actually extending it much out, more out into the whole of Northern Ireland, particularly into to rural areas across Northern Ireland, and also, as I, as I mentioned, an important governance point around the, the per possible perverse incentive that, that exists. Uh, and I don't think on a governance basis that that can be allowed to continue to be the case, and I think the PHA are right to, to consider that. But let, there, let no one be under any illusion here. This is not about doing away with a lifeline service. It is about how that service might operate and who might operate that service. It is not about doing away with lifeline and the important work that needs to be done in terms of providing that service for people who are um, contemplating suicide. I call Sandra Overend. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for, uh, for his responses. Does the Minister accept that the Lifeline Service uh, plays a truly uh, invaluable role across every corner of Northern Ireland, uh, and that allegations or insinuations of it being a Belfast-centric service are truly inaccurate? Well, yeah, it, is, it is something, the, the issue of rurality, and given that the member represents a, a rural constituency, I think it would be something she would be concerned and interested in. The allegations around whether it serves um, the whole of Northern Ireland as well as it does perhaps some bits of it is something that has certainly been put to me. I think it, if it is a criticism that has been put to me, I think it's well worth examining because um, the member will know that there are particularly something out in rural communities a hidden um, mental health problems and, and there can be suicides and I know from even from my own constituency members of the farming community um, um, taking their own lives and I think we should be seeking to do what best we can to ensure that services like Lifeline are spread right across Northern Ireland. That's certainly what I want to see as an outcome from this process. It's certainly something I'd be carefully keeping an eye on as, as any final recommendation comes up to, to me as Minister to sign off on. But again, you know, this is about getting the best possible service for people in Northern Ireland, it is not um, about. It is about protecting what is best, but also improving the service that can be delivered. Moving on, I call Edmund Putz. Number four, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I have indicated consistently over the last number of weeks and months that immediate pressures surrounding waiting lists and our emergency departments can only be resolved with the injection of funding as quickly as possible. The Health and Social Care Board and Trusts are already putting in place plans uh, should additional funding become available, and this will, of course, be focused on patients with the greatest clinical need. However, even with additional funding, there are limits to what the system can deliver before the end of this year. For the longer term, I have asked the Board to examine how we can deal with demand and stabilise waiting times to put them on a more sustainable footing over the next few years. This elective uh, care work will set out what areas need stabilised, how and when this can be achieved, and what it will cost to get performance back to the nine 
9 and 13 week position that the health service previously achieved. I expect to receive this uh, work soon, the conclusions of this work soon. Of course, it is a great frustration to me that we have wasted close to £200 million of taxpayers' money during the last three years in penalties because of the continued failure to implement welfare reform. This, this has affected thousands of vulnerable people who have not been able to obtain the operations they desperately need. Every month we are losing £9.5 million that could pay for over 1,800 hip operations or 2,100 knee operations. And that is the end of our period for listed questions. And we now move on to topical questions. And I call Megan Fearon. Um, Mr. I can't under, underestimate the importance of a fully functioning 24 7 emergency department, particularly for rural communities like my own. So, can I ask the Minister if he'll do all in his power to protect the future of Daisy Hill ED? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm aware of the issue that the, the member raises. Uh, I've spoken to her, her colleague, um, Mr. Murphy, about this. Um, and I have certainly no desire, do not wish to see emergency services uh, reduced at Daisy Hill Hospital. But as a member will appreciate, my um, priority will always be to try to ensure the highest possible levels of quality and safety in our health and social care services. I know and the member will appreciate that there have been issues about recruitment and retention in emergency department in the emergency department in Dizzy Hill Hospital. Um, work has been undertaken by the Trust to try to alleviate that. It has been dealt a further blow by a, um, a decision of a member of staff to leave um, early next year. Uh, and I know that members representing that area or the area that would be covered uh, by the Dizzy Hill Hospital were informed of that last week. Um, and you know, I, I, I think it is right. I think the letter that went to members of this House and perhaps to MPs as well um, was right to point out um, that raising this issue was we, we are right to be concerned. I think the, the actual wording was while we appreciate the concerns of the local community, we would worry that further speculation over the future of the emergency department will significantly hinder our ability to attract medical staff to help the situation. Uh, I think the member appreciates that point, and she's, she's right to raise it today, but it's unfortunate that others uh, ran to the press within 24 hours, um, putting additional problems um, and, and doing exactly what was advised not to do. And if we are to resolve the issue around recruiting and retaining staff at Daisy Hill, which I want to do, the member wants to do, I'm sure everybody representing the area and living in the area wants to do, it isn't helped by scaremongering by some in the press around the situation at, at um, Daisy Hill. I think we should all be trying to collectively work together to address the issues that are there, work with the trust, work with the board, work with others to try to alleviate the problems. I call Michael, Megan Fearon for supplementary. I thank the Minister for his answer so far. I think this is especially important um, given the completely inadequate ambulance service cover that there is in South Armagh. And recently, the South Armagh first responders were set up as a, community, um, a piece of community innovation to tackle a problem. But I think that the Health Minister needs to bring his own innovation in terms of recruitment and new, uh, new and fresh ideas. Getting there. <laughs> new, new and fresh ideas because to date, his predecessors have failed to tackle the recruitment problem that we've been, that's been bubbling up within the health service. Look, there, there have been, you know, I think there were, um, and predates my time, and, and, and both my immediate predecessors are, are in the House, um, and work was done to address the overall problem that there are with emergency departments and recruiting. It's a, it's a very difficult area to work in. I think we all appreciate and understand that, and very can be challenging to recruit sufficient numbers too. I met with the Royal College of Emergency um, Medicine last week to discuss not specifically this issue at Daisy Hill, but, but a range of, of issues. They welcomed the efforts that had been put in in the last number of years to try to attract more staff to emergency medicine. Uh, they didn't by any means conclude that we were out of the woods or we had solved all of the problems. There were still issues there. Um, but they, I'm sure, would agree with me that the most important thing in serving all of our people, wherever they are, whether in Newry or Newton Ards, is that they have the highest standard of care and the highest safety of care. And I would be irresponsible in my job. I would be going against the duty that I have if, 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 if staff are coming to me and saying that there are issues with patient safety, that if I wasn't to act upon that. So, you know, I, I, there are issues and there are challenges at Daisy Hill. I'm aware of them. I look to the trust to, to try to work at resolving those. I'm happy to make my own suggestions if, if I have them. And indeed, I'm, I'm prepared to listen to others who come forward with suggestions. So if a member or anybody in the House has ideas or suggestions about how we might resolve the issues at Daisy Hill, I'm happy to listen to them. I call Ian McRae. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Can the Minister outline whether he's had any discussions with Sir Liam Donaldson regarding the recommendations that he has in his report? Deputy Speaker, I met with the, um, 
met with Sir Liam Donaldson at a conference that he was in Belfast uh, to speak at last Thursday. It was organised by the Faculty of Medical Leadership and Management. Um, and I had an opportunity, he spoke in the morning, I spoke in the afternoon, I had an opportunity in between to have a brief conversation with him. And uh, I, I welcome, if I began, Mr Deputy Speaker, I welcome him, welcoming um, his positive response to the reforms that I put forward in my speech in Balamina almost a fortnight ago. Um, and he obviously gave some comments to the media as well, which I mentioned um, or responded to Mr Majimsi in respect of. And I think that Sir Liam has been incredibly positive in his response. The report that he produced was a very useful report. Um, and whilst I don't think all of us would have agreed entirely 100% with everything that he suggested in it, I welcome the fact that he has acknowledged that the spirit of what he was putting forward has been uh, agreed and taken forward in the proposals that I made. So I've had a useful conversation with him and I've welcomed the comments that he make, uh, made and, and, I, and I will look to him in the future to uh, also to, to, I'm, I'm sure given the work that he has done here, the interest that he has, he will continue to have a keen interest in, in Northern Ireland, particularly in, in terms of how we roll out the reforms that I've put forward. for supplementary. Given the reforms that the Minister has put forward, um, many of which will no doubt um, do um, financially benefits to um, the health service. Can the Minister outline how he sees the speed of this process and, and see how that we can get and feel some real change as quickly as possible? Mr De Deputy Speaker, I, I know that urgent change is, is required within our health and social care system because of the extent of those looming challenges that we, we face within health and social care. So we're, we know and we've discussed at length today that the financial pressures that our budget and indeed all budgets in this place are under, but coupled with that in health, we have a, a growing and an aging population which presents a series of challenges. Uh, we have um, the sort of ticking time bomb of, of unhealthy lifestyles, even good things like uh, medical technological advances are putting additional pressures on, on costs and increasing demand. So I know that urgent action is required. I have put out a, a, a roadmap of reform in the speech that I made, uh, both in terms of getting rid of bureaucracy, unnecessary bureaucracy within our system, and also then seeking to configure our hospital services in the most appropriate way to deal with those challenges and also to give the beneficial outcome of a world-class health and social care system for people in Northern Ireland. That is not easy to do. It takes time. I wish that I could make it happen overnight. I can't do that. I don't have that magic uh, ability to do that. If I could, I would. And I won't take a minute longer to do it than is necessary. But we need to be mindful that there are processes that need to go through in closing down organisations within the public sector. But as I said previously, I will make sure that um, whatever can be done short without the need for legislation will be done and will be implemented as, as, as quickly as possible. The work in terms of the recommendations of a panel will take longer, and that's why I've said that that might take half a decade or, or even up to, to 10 years. So that is work that is very much long term, but is more, even though it is long term, we cannot lose sight of the need to do it. I call Paul Gervin. Thank you very much indeed. Minister, uh, subject to the announcement that was made uh, a few weeks ago to the House in relation to the air ambulance, uh, is it possible to have an update in relation to that matter? Mr Deputy Speaker, I was very, very glad to announce back in September my commitment to introducing an air ambulance service uh, for Northern Ireland. And that was a, an announcement that I think has been very well received uh, across Northern Ireland. Um, I committed to carrying out a, a consultation. Uh, I am hope to be in a position this week to launch that consultation, and that consultation will look at a range of important issues, um, which um, I think it's, it's, it's pivotal that we come to a conclusion on in respect of our ambulance, things like where an air ambulance might be based in, what its location might be, how it might be funded, to what level in terms of clinical involvement it should be staffed. So there are a range of, of serious issues beyond the basic commitment to do it that need to be ironed out, and I hope that a consultation can do that. And I would encourage um, everyone who has an interest to contribute to that consultation. I'm sure there will be a range of, of very different views around uh, what it might be, but the important thing is that we realise that vision that was set out by Dr John Hines and indeed by, by many of his colleagues um, that Northern Ireland um, can sustain and our ambulance service and indeed needs one. Thank, you. Thank the Minister for his answer and uh, appreciate the positive approach that has been taken in this matter. Uh, all politics being local, I would ask, and I'm putting this forward as a, a good suggestion, the International Airport being 
located within uh, our constituency would be an ideal location for such a service to be uh, put. Would the minister consider this to be possible? There, there seems to be. There seems to be. Common accord, even from other other constituencies around, around the chamber, for that suggestion. Look, I don't want to. I want to leave it to the consultation to particularly look at issues around where, where it might be located. I don't want to make a commitment here or there, or, or, um, specifically t today, or, or I may be tempted to say Newton Ards Airport. Actually, um, uh, I think I think it is incredibly important. It is incredibly important that in taking forward such a, a serious thing, which is to, to benefit people in, in Northern Ireland for years ahead, that we get it right in terms of how it's funded, we get it right in terms of um, clinically how it's, how it's uh, operated, we also get it right in terms of where it's located, Deputy Speaker. Uh, and I don't want to prejudge the consultation. There are certain advantages I acknowledge in terms of Alder Grove and in terms of co location with. Uh, the police service of Northern Ireland, who have a series of helicopters there, I'm not sure exactly the number, but I know it's more than, more than a, hand, it's a handful of them anyway. Um, there are certain advantages there, there's good geographical advantages to it as well, but I certainly don't want to rule out anywhere, and there are maybe other considerations as to the, the total geographical area that a, um, a helicopter emergency medical service might cover. So certainly it is, you, your, um, your bid for Alder Grove is heard loudly and clearly. I call from McCann. Neil Mahogan, uh, last concorder. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And, uh, can the Minister say what he's doing uh, to address the shortage of consultants in the matter hospital? Yeah, I, I thought that this issue may come up today because it obviously it developed over the last number of days. It's very, very definition of a topical question. Um, there are, much as uh, Ms. Fearing and her issue around Daisy Hill raised concerns about consultant cover there are similar issues have arisen in the emergency department in the matter hospital and as I said to her my, my job I believe and indeed anybody who holds this po post should be to ensure the highest possible levels of quality and safety in our health and social care services the Belfast Health and Social Care Trust advised my department last week of service difficulties at the matter hospital emergency department and as a precautionary measure in response to concerns raised by senior medical staff about medical cover in the evening and overnight uh, and the management of paediatric patients, the Belfast Trust has instigated short-term measures to ensure safe, effective arrangements are in place outside normal working hours and to ensure children needing emergency uh, treatment get that treatment in the most appropriate place. The Belfast Trust emergency departments are managed as a, a full joined-up service, and this precautionary measure is implemented on a coordinated basis to ensure continuity of service in Belfast. So overnight ambulance diver diverts from the matter are expected to remain in place as a temporary measure and children will be redirected to the nearby Royal Belfast Hospital for sick children, which has a dedicated paediatric emergency department where the Belfast Trust seeks to resolve the concerns identified and recruit senior medical staff. And as I made the point to Ms. Fearn, if clinicians are coming to me, it's coming to my department, and they're saying that a service as it's being run in the short or longer term is unsafe, then I have a duty to, to listen to them and I have a duty to act. A call from a CAM for supplementary. And uh, I want to thank uh, the Minister for his answer, and I accept and appreciate that uh, there are many difficulties in this, uh, but uh, Connie assures that he will do all within his part uh, to try and ensure uh, that consultancy posts are filled and that uh, so it can meet the demand uh, in the matter husband. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I mean, I'm certainly uh, committed to doing that, um, to ensure the highest quality of care and, and safety of care can be carried out in the matter or in Daisy Hill or wherever it might be. I'm certainly committed to do that. And I think that he should, and, and I know he, I'm sure he does, acknowledge the challenges that there are in terms of recruitment. There are, are, there's much competition inside Northern Ireland, never mind outside of Northern Ireland. Um, and you know, I certainly will, will do my best. And as I mentioned before, a conversation with the Royal College of Emergency Medicine last week who have acknowledged uh, I hope they, I can speak from them saying this, acknowledge the good work that has been done by predecessors in terms of trying to recruit more people into emergency medicine, but certainly they were making the warning to me that some of the things that we are talking about today around Daisy Hill and, and the Matter Hospital, um, there is a risk of those happening, and we need to do our very best to ensure that that, that doesn't happen and try to put in place the, the appropriate resources, and particularly in terms of staff. And I'd certainly make that commitment to do all that I can to ensure that uh, the issue is in the matter hospital is resolved in the short term and is made sustainable in the longer term. I call Jim Wells. The uh, Minister is aware of the concern about the future of Sleeve Row House in Kilkeel. Can we provide me with an update on the Southern Trust consultation on this issue? Thank the member for his question. I know it's an issue that he is um, 
a deep and long-standing interest in, in terms of the, the um, Slave Row home in Kilkeel. Um, as he will know, the, the recommendation from the Trust, which went out of consultation, was that Slave Row should, should close. However, the Board uh, recognised that there are limited alternative options available in the uh, Morn and Kilkeel area, and they have agreed to reopen it to admissions until alternative options, in particular the proposed 12-unit supported living facility, become available in, in the spring of, of 2017. Um, those proposals will have gone to the board. They will come to, to me as minister to ultimately sign off on, uh, and I will obviously be cons um, considering a range of factors before making my final decision. Um, and I think it's worth probably re-emphasising again, if I can, the, the commitment that, uh, that he and um, Minister Putz, when he was in post, and I have reiterated as well that no resident who is currently in any of the homes that are earmarked for closure, if a final decision is taken for closure, none of them will be moved if they do not wish to move. And uh, our time for questions is up.